two, one. Okay, let's start. Hi everyone, I'm Reza Azadeh, founder and CEO at Matroid and an adjunct professor at Stanford. Today I'm speaking with Chris Hadfield, who is an all-around amazing Canadian astronaut. He's the first Canadian to walk in space, the first Canadian to command the International Space Station. He's had a very, very productive and inspirational career in general working across uh, many aspects of space travel. He's been aboard the Space Shuttle Endeavour. He's helped build the Mir space station. And as a Canadian, he was the top test pilot in both the US Air Force and the, and the US Navy and was indicted into Canada's Aviation Hall of Fame. I met Chris at the University of Toronto in the Creative Destruction Lab where he helps uh, st space startups and I'm helping the machine learning startups. Chris and I had a flight together in the Bay Area where we went around in a tail dragger airplane. And that was the beginning of our conversations about the applications of artificial intelligence and machine learning and software in general in space. He has been writing many books. He's written books uh, that, are, uh, that are fiction and then also fact. Today, he's gonna to be talking to us about software in space and his new book, The Apollo Murders. So let's get to it. Can we start perhaps with some questions about space in general, uh, Chris? And sure. We can, uh, and then we can dive deeper into, into related areas that you feel like, and then, and then the book and, and wherever else. So we also have audience questions that we recorded from Matroiders and other people around the world that we can ask you if you would be kind enough. Great. All right. Um, so really burning on top of my mind right now is I hope that during, so I, I never got to see the, the, the moon landings. Uh, I think uh, a lot of uh, people watching this never, never did either. Um, the current uh, exciting news about the space program is that we're going back to the moon and hopefully also going to Mars. Uh, the moon, given that we've done it before, I'm really hopeful that we do it again and, and seems very realistic. Now, there are three different spaceships that are trying to also take us to Mars uh, that are being built, right? There's the NASA Space Launch System, uh, there's SpaceX's, uh, the, the SpaceX Starship, and there's Blue Origins and New Glenn Rocket. And all three of these are hoping uh, that they will be able to take us all the way to Mars and land us there and hopefully bring us back as well. Now, uh, do, the question is, is do you think, so I'm sure you're following all of these technologies and seeing how they're evolving. The question is, do you think that these technologies are going to be realistically able to take us all the way to Mars and back? It's a two year journey. They would have to, I, currently the fastest we seem to be able to start towards another um, planet like Mars is about 25,000 miles per hour around Mach 32. And at that speed, it'd take us two years to get there uh, and back. Uh, well, to, uh, actually, you, maybe you could tell us about the timelines that you feel like uh, are plausible. Sure. And that's a long time to stay there. So what do you think we could be doing with our current technology with regard to visiting Mars? And, and uh, when do you think we'll visit Mars and, and the moon again? So, Rez, I think it, the whole thing is driven, is, is driven and limited by, um, by technology. <clears throat> like, obviously, when I was born, Nobody had ever flown in space. Like I, I'm just the right age. I was born slightly before Gagarin flew. So space flight is younger than I am. It's still really new, right? And so it wasn't hard to fly in space when I was born. It was impossible. No human being had ever done it. So the only thing that enabled us to do that, even though we've been dreaming about it since you know Greek mythology and Icarus and Daedalus and all that, um, and what enabled it was uh, invention of certain combinations of technologies, you know, and some of them driven by peaceful purposes. Some of those technologies were driven by, by war, but it, it, regardless, we ended up with new ways of doing things. And then people started applying them to interesting uh, problems. And so in 57, Sputnik was launched and it had been impossible to put a satellite in orbit up until then. And then Gagarin in 61, and they went to the moon in 69. And now spaceflight seems sort of common. I mean, I'm an advisor to Virgin Galactic and we're just, uh, you know, in, in July of this year, both Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin flew unqualified people 
up into space and back, just to the very bottom of space, but still, that's brand new. And September of this year, four unqualified people are gonna fly a SpaceX ship and orbit the world for three days. And that's new, that's crazy. You know, They're gonna be up there and go around the world 40 or 50 times. None of them are professional astronauts. They're smart people, but still, you know, that's, that's a brand new technological opening of a door. So when you talk about going to the moon and going to the moon to stay, and then across the big interplanetary ocean that's between us and Mars, um, the real question is, is our technology good enough yet or not? Because it wasn't uh, during the Apollo era to get to, get to Mars, no way. Uh, and even now, uh, as you say, if we burn chemical fuels, get going kind of as fast as we can, you're still going to take on the order of six months just to get from here to Mars. Six months. You know, think of all the things and all the risks that you faced in your last six months. And then when you get there, you don't just want to whip around Mars and come straight back. Kind of, you know, what's the point? You kind of want to get there and slow down and get into orbit and then get down to the surface. But then you got to do all this stuff backwards again, unless you go on a one-way trip and get back up to orbit and then accelerate to that same huge speed in another six months. So as you say, when you tally that all together and you got to wait till Earth and Mars are, you know, kind of lined up on orbits, you're talking, as you say, a couple of year commitment. And the trouble is nothing serious can go wrong in those couple of years. Otherwise, everybody dies. There's, you can't turn around. You can't go anywhere else. There is no lifeboat. If your ship fails, if your water purification or food generation or oxygen purification or, or propulsion or navigation, if anything, if a meteorite hits you, anything fails, you're dead. So is this the right time in history? You know, is our technology good enough? Eventually it will be. We'll be able to go to Mars effortlessly, just sort of like you know, how easily right now we can just get on an airplane, sit in our seat and, and fly across the Atlantic or something. You know, it's very proven technology. So we'll get there. But I think we have a lot of stuff to invent still and, and not just invent, but prove. And it's what we've been doing on the space station for the last 20 years, not just running the 200 experiments, but testing equipment, testing you know, how do you make a toilet that'll last 20 years without gravity? How do you, how do you make an oxygen purification, carbon, removal, carbon dioxide removal system, all those other things, what works in, in weightlessness and what doesn't? And how do you generate power? And how long does the solar ray last? And all the rest of it. And, and what, how well can the human body withstand and the human mind? And all of those things need to be proven. And, and as soon as we leave the earth moon system, then you're way out in interplanetary space where the radiation is higher and, and there's risks we don't even know about. So, so there's a lot of stuff to invent. So my guess is we need to keep the eye on Mars because it's got water, it's got reasonable gravity, it's got an atmosphere, not a, not a thick atmosphere, but an atmosphere. So it's the best place in the solar system to live except for Earth. But we need to continue developing and testing on the space station and then go that next step three days away to develop and test and prove and establish ourselves on the moon just three days away. And that's where SpaceX is headed. And that's where the US government, actually all the space agencies are headed. And that's where uh, Blue Origin's headed. That's what they're all doing. And with the stuff they can learn there, who knows, maybe it'll take a decade, maybe 15 years of trial and error and getting things wrong then We'll have learned enough things and maybe our engines will be better so that we can uh, confidently turn tail to Earth and the moon and uh, and blast off from Mars. We'll get there, but um, but it's still way on the hairy edge of capable or of possible right now. And, and if we tried to do it right now, my guess is we'd kill everybody every time. So we, we need oh, to no. invent some stuff first. So, so in terms of technology hurdles, uh, certainly thrusting perhaps all the way there, or at least getting off to a faster start so that you can continue on the faster velocity all the way to Mars seems to be a big one. So, so either going faster or continuing uh, thrust all the way, uh, just to minimize the amount of time that astronauts have to be uh, essentially exposed in, in space, uh, not exposed, but you know, hanging out in space in, a, in a, just a traveling ship. Um, but then also this major difference with, with um, the moon where there's much less gravity on the moon because it's a, it's a, it's a less massive object. Um, 
so you could basically have this tiny tank of fuel on the moon and 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 use it to to lift off and and come back to something that's orbiting uh that's out of the question with uh, mars you have to have all this uh, additional fuel you have to have even propellant production on the surface if you can't take enough fuel with you that seems to be the, the in my mind the, the even bigger the, a problem than um than uh, than just getting there fast do you think that that propellant production or taking enough fuel with you is is the bigger problem or just the fact that we can't seem to get there fast enough i think one of the big questions you need to ask is is why why are we going to mars you know is is it just curiosity or or um, are we hoping to discover something there that's valuable that we can market back to the earth? I mean, why do we go anywhere? Why are we in Antarctica? Why, you know, why do we explore the more remote portions of the world? Why are we exploring the sea floors? You know, what, what makes it worth the risk and worth the cost? And right now the answers for Mars are, are kind of thin based on the amount of risk and cost involved. If you could get to Mars in 10 minutes for 10 bucks, then, <laughs> you know, everybody, everybody'd be going to Mars, but, but, you know, you can't. And so you've got to balance out um, where is the break even point of, of the risk and the cost versus the benefit. And uh, one of the biggest reasons it's so expensive is because it's so slow. You know, with, if we just burn dinosaurs, you know, burn fossil fuels and we accelerate for, you know, 10 minutes, and then you coast for six months. Imagine if you and I were going to go to Australia and I said, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to get out just off the shore, you know, off of where you can see Golden Gate behind us. We're going to get in this weird boat that's going to accelerate like crazy for six minutes or 10 minutes. And then we're going to coast for six months to Australia. What a dumb way to get anywhere. But that's kind of the best we've come up with to get to Mars. And then when you get there, you're going too fast to stop. So you have to brought enough fuel to then slow down and somehow capture orbit when you get there. And then Mars astro atmosphere, it's just sort of the opposite of Goldilocks, right? It is, it is perfectly wrong. It's not thick enough to slow you down properly, but it's not nearly thin enough to ignore it. And you can't breathe it so because it's almost all carbon dioxide. But so you have to fight the atmosphere all the way down to the surface. And that takes more fuel and more weight. So I'm kind of personally convinced we will never go to Mars if we're just using the engine technology that, that we use right now to get to orbit and to go to the moon and back, unless our reason to go there jacks way up. Like if, if we discovered something on Mars that is immensely valuable to humanity, then it'd be worth the risk. Or if, if Earth, for whatever reason, like if uh, you know, the, the caldera that's in Yellowstone had a wicked eruption and Earth suddenly started becoming more and more uninhabitable to the point that uh, you know, it was a threat, an existential threat to life itself, then that would be a reason, you know, sort of like in, in Robert Heinlein's uh, The Martian Chronicles, where Mars then becomes another place to go. And there are lots of scenarios, asteroids aimed at the Earth, things like that, where you could say, okay, it'd be nice to get all of our eggs out of one basket, at least get some of us somewhere else. But you've got to have both that pull and you got to have the push to get there. And to me, the area where we are going to make the biggest strides is in better engines. And to cut the time, as you say, rather than put your foot to the floor for 12 minutes and then coast for half a year, um, it's much better to put their foot to the floor, maybe not quite so hard, but close for, you know, one month and then turn around backwards and then decelerate for a month. So you like accelerate so that you have some gravity as you're accelerating. And then you turn around backwards and you have a little gravity as you decelerate and you show up at Mars at the right speed, maybe, you know, a month or two months later, maybe three months, depending on what, what engines you're assuming. And there are people working on those engines. You know, Franklin Chang Diaz and the Ad Astra company down in Houston, he's a an MIT PhD and he's an astronaut has flown in space seven times. And, uh, Franklin's work on an engine to do that, but you need a big power source. You kind of need a nuclear power source for it. Or, or, and there's some pretty good advances in fusion. And it may be that as soon as we crack uh, containable fusion, suddenly all of this is going to change. And it's got a fusion engine, a compact, non-polluting, uh, extremely dense power source. Then, then maybe that's what we need, and that's what's going to allow us to go to Mars. So, so to me, it's, it's all really interesting. But we're going to live on station for another decade, and then we're going to 
you know, put tentative footsteps and then permanent footsteps and then uh, start settling the moon, especially in the hospitable areas where there's power and water. And, and then eventually, hopefully we'll have invented enough things that Mars gets a lot easier. That, that's how it looks to me. That's, that's excellent. Like you said, like, uh, it seems like one of the major questions to answer is whether there's some uh, uh, extinct life that maybe could have been on Mars a long, long time ago. And it's a, it's a bit ironic that we're burning our previously extinct life uh, <laughs> in an attempt to try and discover other extinct life. So it's a, it's a little bit of a, yeah, it's a little bit of a weird situation there. Um, yeah, thank you for that. I'm going to look into uh, look into nuclear propulsion for space travel, and and uh, I'm sure we'll have lots more interesting conversations about it. Um, so moving on, uh, so so I'd like to give a quick summary of of the so so it, it's almost like uh, it, yeah, using this excitement, I'd like to give a quick summary of the book, uh, the Apollo Murders. This book, and that's the one. And um, and then we can start diving into it. So the book summary. Hey, is I just I just want to say I don't know if you've seen, but uh, the people that have pre-read this, it's not just you, but the people that have pre-read it, like maybe you were going to mention it, but James Cameron, the movie maker, he loves this book, and and Frederick Forsyth, who wrote The Day of the Jackal, and um, I actually. <laughs> as I was learning how to write fiction, I read The Day of the Jackal because it's such a beautifully crafted thriller action movie or action book. And now to have Frederick Forsyth say, this is you know a book that you got to read. And Andy Weir loves the book and Publishers Weekly. I'm just, I'm amazed and delighted that, uh, that not just Reza, but other people are enjoying <laughs> the Apollo murders too. I'm going to I'm going to ping those people and tell them about uh, this video and hopefully we can uh, we can we can speak with them about the about the details. So this is this is actually your first fiction book, right? So you've written many books before, but this is the first fiction, right? That's right. I wrote uh, I wrote a book. Uh, I wrote a book about how to lead a better life called Astronaut's Guide to Life on Earth. And it's done great. It's in 25 languages and it, it, it looks like a biography, but it's, it's, um, it's basically exactly what the title says, An Astronaut's Guide to Life on Earth. And it's done great. And then I did a book of imagery uh, called You Are Here, uh, Pictures of the World. And then I did a children's book uh, about um, how it's, it's normal um, to be afraid and, and how to deal with that and, and how, to, uh, how to recognize that um, the dark is, uh, you know, is for dreaming. And that's where you can see the stars. So it's called The Darkest Dark. But this is my fourth book, The Apollo Murders. And you're right, it's the first fiction that I've written. And uh, that was a whole, whole different challenge to try and, uh, try and, you know, figure out how to solve. All right, let's, so let's dive into it. So as Soviet and American crews sprint for a secret hidden bounty away on the moon's surface, old rivalries blossom and the political stakes are stretched to breaking point back on Earth. Houston flight controller Kaz Zemeckis must do all he can to keep the NASA crew together while staying one step ahead of their Russian rivals. But not everyone on board Apollo 18 is quite who they appear to be. So as, as far as I can um, like reveal um, without, without ruining the book, and also I have an old version of the book, so, so, so things may have changed. Um, this, this, like, this is the, seems like the Cold War never ended. And then we have this continuation of the rivalry between Russia and the US all the way into the uh, perhaps other, other planets, into the space station and in other places where it gets pretty, it gets pretty gnarly. So I, I know you've never written uh, fiction before, uh, before this book. Um, so, so you basically, now that you have full freedom of like making stuff up, <laughs> but you know, in, an, in, a, in, a, in a way that is exciting and then relates to your experiences, you set this book uh, in 1973. So uh, why, why that date? And then does it relate to realities that you faced uh, or, or, or is it something more for storyline purposes? So why 1973? Sure, so uh, I, I was a, a Cold War combat pilot. Uh, I used to fly armed F-18s for NORAD intercepting Soviet bombers that were in, in NORAD in North American airspace. So, uh, that was the Cold War in the 80s. But in the 70s, when, when the Apollo murders is set in 73, the Cold War was pretty intense and, and real saber rattling between the Soviet Union and the United States. And at the same time, 
the moon race was on. The Soviets were trying so desperately to repeat their successes with, you know, Alexei, uh, well, Alexa Leonov, who did the world's first spacewalk, Valentina Tereshkova, first woman in space, um, Yuri Gagarin, first human being in space. They had a huge head start, but uh, the Americans caught up and surpassed them by getting to the moon first, but the race was still going on. And the Soviets were, were working so hard to, to show uh, that their particular geopolitical system, you know, uh, was equal to or better than the, the one that the uh, Americans had and, and still have. And so it, it provided a really um, tense background for the story, one that is completely real and is based in, in my experience as a Cold War fighter pilot. Um, in fact, I did Canada's first F-18 intercept of Soviet bombers uh, when, we, when the airplane was brand new. Um, and then I looked for other, other threads of stories that might allow me the room to write an interesting thriller. You know, it's really sort of an alternative history thriller book. And there was some amazing stuff happening in the spring of 73. Number one, uh, the last of the Apollo flights, Apollo 17, had just gone just before Christmas of 72. So, and there was intended to be an Apollo 18, but Nixon canceled it. So I looked for a, what other reason might there have been to rekindle Apollo 18? Because they he just canceled it for financial reasons. So where else could Nixon dip into someone else's pot of money that would fund another moon mission? And you know, obviously the DOD in the US has enormous part of the, of the national budget. And so to combine DOD purposes, military purposes with uh, the Apollo program, and oddly enough, the United States had a program like that in the 60s called the Manned Orbiting Laboratory, uh, and, and Nixon had canceled that as well. So this provided me with an interesting way to, to generate Apollo 18. So now I've got another mission going. At the same time, the Soviets, and you'll probably want to talk about this, but the Soviets had not just like the American Manned Orbiting Laboratory, the Soviets had a manned orbiting laboratory that they called Diamond, which in, in Russian is Almaz. And they had Almaz flying. And the weirdest thing happened, this is for real, to an Almaz in the spring of 73. It launched at the start of April and something unknown happened to it. And that Almaz space station suddenly malfunctioned and came apart and, uh, and deorbited a few months later. So this is a real thing that happened that gave me another potential plot twist. Also, in January of 73, as part of the effort for the Soviet Union to, uh, to have access to the moon, they had this uh, a rover. Uh, if, if you take the, the word moon walker, or moon uh, mover, uh, the, the Russian literal translation for that is Luna Chod, Luna Chod. And they had a vehicle driving around on Mars in, uh, or on the moon in uh, this early 73 called Luna Chod. And it was a terrific scientific exploration rover. And it had a little um, a radio thermal isotope down in the middle of it to keep it warm. And it was driving around for months and months, but, in the spring of 73, mysteriously, Luna Chod malfunctioned and overheated and died. So I thought, well, that's an interesting story thread. And Watergate was going on. Just the tapes were just, you know, they'd been through the election. Nixon was back in with a big majority, but the reality of, of what had happened at the Watergate Hotel was just starting to come to the fore. And so the, you know, the, the cracks were forming around the, around the hero statue that Nixon was on for sure. And um, there had been some important legislation that the US had just put through about women's rights. And, and so those two things happening in the background allowed me then to develop some ideas on characters that, that otherwise you know, might not have made sense back in 1965 or even 1969. Um, and so I, I picked up all of those threads. And then as you said in that intro, I needed a good character who could be a central person, um, not just trapped inside the spaceship, but you know, some way to pivot it all together. And that's the role of uh, Kaz Zemeckis, who, um, who you know, has, he's got a pretty interesting background himself, as you'll read. And, uh, and he sort of becomes the pivot guy of, of trying to thread all this stuff together. 
um, as Apollo 18 happens and there's big Soviet um, involvement. And, and because I lived in Russia for five years and I was NASA's director of ops in Russia, and, you know, learned to speak the language, I flew a Russian spaceship as the pilot on my third flight. Um, and I helped build Mir back in the 90s and such. It gave me a, a, an unusual amount of insight into the Soviet space program and a little bit into, you know, just Russian people. Uh, I've you know, been there enough to have some sort of understanding of, of the differences. And so I, I got to put all of that together and try and build a credible story. Um, and, and obviously uh, from the title uh, where people get murdered uh, as part of something that's happening with Apollo. And, and I'm really delighted at, at, at every time I chase down to some idea, I'm going, wow, what a great coincidence, you know, that, that, that happened right then. And I can make that part of the story and, uh, and make it all, all fit together. And yeah, I'm really thrilled with how, uh, how, how the book came out. That's one of the things that constantly had me second guessing and questioning. And I wish I could bring up more of them without room. So, so the, the, the consistent question in my head was, is, was that real or was that one of the main, so. Uh, oh, let me interrupt. It was I, funny. I, I, when I sent you a copy, I sent that copy to Jim Cameron as well. He's down in New Zealand filming um, Avatar. He's actually way heavy into the editing phase of Avatar. But when he, when he wrote me a note back, he said, oh, whenever you're talking to people about this, uh, don't say like, well, it's all made up. Say, <laughs> well, uh, none up? of this, none of this happened or did it. <laughs> and, and that, that's what Jim said. I, I should, I should say to everybody, because actually I think about 90% of the stuff in the book actually did happen. And on over half of the characters in the book are real people. You know, some of the ones you wouldn't even think are real people. So, so yeah, it, uh, I question mark. I'm, I'm glad it was above your head. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, you're just, you're, you're, you're constantly um, wondering if, so obviously I live in the U.S., so I'm, I'm more or less on the U.S. side, so then the Russian things that, that happen seem outrageous, and then I'm constantly wondering, did that really, <laughs> did that really happen? Um, so I guess, let me ask you this as much as you can answer it, or feel free to just say, no, I can't, I, we shouldn't answer that, otherwise it sort of ruins the magic of the book. So did you observe Russian Cold War tactics that were similar to the plot of Apollo murders? Like, is there, was, is there a Russian Cold War tactic that, um, uh, that you especially want to highlight that makes an appearance in the book? Or shall we, shall we leave that for the readers? I, I think actually I want to highlight an American Cold War tactic that is relevant to the book. And it's something a lot of people don't know. But the space shuttle you know, a, a reusable vehicle to go up to Earth orbit and back regularly. Um, it was conceived in the 60s and then designed in the 70s. But with the Vietnam War ending, you know, right about the time of the Apollo murders, um, there, and, and a lot of, you know, social programs, and, and they'd already been to the moon, uh, there was a lot of reasons for Nixon to cut funding out of the space program. And he had the space shuttle, you know, somewhere in the distance as the next program. Um, so they didn't have enough money uh, for the space shuttle to do it the way they wanted. And so in order to finance the space shuttle, there had to be big cooperation with the Department of Defense. And in fact, it was the US Air Force and, and their precursors to US Space Command, which recently got renamed as, as just uh, what Space Force, but it, it's been going since you know the 70s. Um, they got significant money for the space shuttle early on, but it had to meet US Air Force objectives. And if you look at the space shuttle with the payload bay that's got a 15 foot diameter and it's 60 feet long, that's because that's how big the uh, Air Force spy telescope was that, that they wanted it to be able to take up. So that sized the space shuttle was for a military purpose. And what's even more amazing that most people don't know is the intent, the design intent in the 70s, about the time that the Apollo murders happens, was to be able to launch out of California, out of Vandenberg there, and go into a polar orbit. So you're going, you know, going to South Pole, North Pole. Um, you're going to launch, they're going to open the doors in the shuttle, astronauts are going to go outside quickly on a spacewalk, grab a Soviet uh, satellite, put it inside, close up those payload bay doors and land all within 90 minutes. 
do it all in one orbit. Wow. And that was an early actual design spec of the space shuttle. The, the papers have been recently been declassified. So when you look at the stuff that I put into the Apollo murders, you'll see just how close to the actual reality uh, of what was really going on and, and the interplay between you know, scientific objectives and um, technical objectives and military objectives, how those three interplayed into the reality that, that became the space shuttle. And, and it, it, to me, it makes the events of the Apollo murders even more credible. Yeah, I mean, that, that what you just described, uh, basically stealing a satellite while it's in orbit, that almost sounds like a movie. And, um, and, and when we, we, we spoke about this, uh, when I initially read the book, I really think it's the perfect script for a movie. And now you just said you had been talking to Jim Cameron. Is it coming? Is a movie coming? We've had a bunch of movie houses talk to us about the book. Yeah. And, um, but I, I sure don't want a, a bad space movie with my name on it. You know, I'd, I'd be forever mortified if, if like, if a, a movie that has my name on it, I made me wince, you know, and, um, <laughs> I talked to, I, I, uh, it, it sounds crazy, but I'm actually friends with uh, Ryan Reynolds. He's another Canadian guy, uh, you know, the actor. And so when we were looking at um, at making, you know, all the movie houses talking to us, I was like, well, you know, sure, it'd be fun to have it made into a movie. And the, and the plot line does lend itself to being kind of a good thriller action movie. But uh, I was just asking Ryan, like, how do you maintain your own integrity? And Ryan said, uh, normally when an author hands the book, you know, to the screenwriter, that's the last time the author has ever seen, you know, and now the whole storyline is up to the screenwriter and the director and the producers as to how they're going to take the raw material of the ideas that are in the book and turn them in, because it can't be the same, obviously, books and movies, everybody knows, wildly different. So, but, so Ryan, you know, he said, it's very weird for an author to still be involved when, when, now, when you've already handed over to the screenwriter. And so that, you know, that worries me a little. And, and what Ryan and, and Ryan and Jim Cameron both said was uh, make sure that you really know and trust the people that are making the movie. Cause it, you know, it's, you've got to, you've got to, they're going to do almost all the work with you not there, no matter what happens, even in an ideal world. So it has to be people that you think you could trust to do a credible job and not just turn it into, you know, space cowboys or uh, Armageddon or something, you know, which is so technically horrific that, that it would just make me cringe to see my own movie. So, um, so uh, I, we're, we're not in a hurry to make a movie out of it. And I don't want to become an impediment to some reputable, you know, uh, people that are really trying to do a good job of this story, you know, where I, I'm this annoying astronaut who always tells them, no, you can't do that. So we'll, we'll see. I, I think it'll make a great movie. But uh, Jim Cameron suggested a few, um, you know, people that he thought would do it right. And obviously movies like Apollo 13, you know, um, or the series that Tom Hanks produced uh, from the earth to the moon, those are really well done. And, and they, they, pay attention to reality, but they also tell a really good human story. Uh, even um, The Martian, you know, great book, but, and there's a little bit of, eh, you know, you, you gotta tell, a, make a movie exciting, but it's it's actually very true to to reality for how characters behave at least, and, and a pretty reasonable reflection of a lot of the things that might happen. And <clears throat> so, you know, uh, and both Ryan and Jim suggested a few, uh, groups of people that would that would do a good job that's awesome I'm looking, <laughs> well i'm looking forward to hearing more about that as it as it develops so uh one of the one of the most exciting uh uh stories that i've seen you uh that are that are true story that that i've seen you uh discuss in public is your 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 uh your spacewalk and uh during the spacewalk you went uh you went partially partially blind as you were doing the spacewalk and yet you had to grit your teeth and uh, and do something about it. Um, so that that's sort of like a, a really weird, difficult situation to be in in space that that is potentially life or death. Now uh, that I know happened. So so you, you can't you can't you can't say that didn't happen anymore since you, you've been doing that. You've been telling that story since before the book. But did that did that story make its way either into the book or did it inspire anything that you had 
uh, going into the book? Well, I don't know where all other authors get their both their inspiration and the raw ideas from, but my impression is having you know talked to some of them and taken some of the writing courses online, is most of it is based in something they observed or some some reality, something or something somebody said or you know something they read somewhere, and th that was very much uh, how I picked and chose all the chose all the things that are in the Apollo murders. And um, in the back of the Apollo murders, you'll find I put in a, a thing called, uh, you know, author's note. And it it does, it keeps you from having to Google everything because it's it, all the stuff or a lot of the stuff that's real in the book is, is laid out here at the back. Um, but it's not all of it. Most of the things in the book are based on something that actually happened. And um, when it comes to spacewalking, uh, as you mentioned at the outset, I've done two spacewalks, been outside about 15 hours, which is 10 times around the world while I was outside. And um, and as you mentioned, uh, I had uh, a malfunction or at least a contamination in the atmosphere inside my suit. And so it got into one eye and then both eyes and I was blinded for, I don't know, about a half hour or so. So that personal experience of, of doing a spacewalk which is like nothing else, you know, it's maybe a little bit like scuba diving, sort of, but it's, it's wildly different as well. Um, and having a serious problem while personal problem while doing a spacewalk. So I knew what it was like on the inside. And then when I was the commander of the international space station on my third space flight, um, one day our station, our space station developed a really serious problem and started spewing its main coolant out into orbit. Liquid ammonia was spewing out of our ship you know, like, uh, like fireworks. Um, and we had to do an emergency spacewalk, um, unexpected, to go and save our ship so that we didn't have to abandon the world spaceship. So I got to see uh, unexpected emergency spacewalking operations from my own experience inside a suit and then as the commander of the ship from outside the suit. And so that gave me a lot of uh, deep background then to figure out how am I going to work that type of, uh, you know, idea into the Apollo murders. And if you think about it, you know, an Apollo mission launched from the Earth, orbited the world, fire its engine, took three days of weightless coasting, got to the moon, orbited the moon, then came down, landed, and then they walked around on the moon. So they were weightless for the majority of the mission. And then they were under the moon, one six gravity, doing a different type of spacewalk for the time that two of them were on the surface of the moon. So, so that's two environments with the potential to do a spacewalk as well. And serious potential for things to go wrong. And where I could live up to the title of the book with the Apollo murders, you know, it's plural. So, um, so you know, yeah, uh, I think my, my personal experiences uh, really helped in, uh, in choosing how I was going to put that in the story. And then in making sure that, uh, that what happened was, was credible and real and something that actually could have happened. So there was a very recent uh, mishap on the space station, or at least there wasn't a recent mishap, but rather we were told ab about the seriousness of the mishap on the space station very recently, which was that a Russian module misfired and seems to have uh, done some serious, uh, uh, at least uh, we, we, we were told perhaps the space station rotated a little bit, but then it turns out that the misfiring actually was very serious and that there were many revolutions. Uh, I don't, I don't think, that was at, uh, at the time that you were on, on board, but, uh, but, but it seems like the kind of thing that, that, uh, that if you were writing perhaps like, a, I, I know you're writing a sequel to, uh, to or well, you might be writing a sequel to, to Apollo Murders. Do you think- I'm writing another book. I'm, I'm writing another book now, yes. Uh, and I'm not sure it's a sequel, but, but I'm writing a, okay. uh, another thriller fiction book, yeah. Okay, sorry, I didn't know that it, I, I assumed too much by even saying that it was a sequel. But another thriller fiction, do you think things like that is, uh, I guess, material for, for any kind of future book? Well, stuff like that happens way more often on the space station than, than you know, the media pays attention to. And it, it's fun for me to watch 
how uh, instantaneously people that know nothing are now trying to intelligently discuss what just happened on the space station. Well, it's in any expert field, right? Like it'd be like me talking about- I'm sorry, about, I even tried. <laughs> no, it'd be like if I would listen to someone talk about surgery or, or what you do at Matroid, you know, I'm an idiot. I, I, I would immediately reveal my, my shallowness of understanding. Um, so, you know, people should stick to their own knitting. But, but if you're in the media, you have to try and at least, uh, I guess, inform people, um, which is fine. And, and, and there's all different, you know, some people do it really well and some people do it execrably, you know, it's just the way it is. But um, the space station is very difficult to keep under control. It's a huge, flexible structure. You know, it, it, it flexes. And, um, and, and how do you, which direction do you point it and why? You know, and, and how do you maintain the balance between absorbing energy on your solar panels and radiating your heat out, out of the radiators? and not overheating one side of the station versus the other, and still maintaining communications with the world while you maintain a good enough um, weightless or microgravity environment for all of your experiments to run properly. It's like this tightrope of conflicting requirements that is happening all the time. And meanwhile, ships are coming and going every, every week or two, and they've all got to fly up and dock with you. And while they're approaching and docking, that's obviously going to mess up you know, how you're controlling things and your sequence of operations. And most of the time we get it so good that everyone just takes it for granted. But once in a while, we, we have a, a, you know, a dumb thing happens. And just like on earth, I mean, has anything ever bad happened in software in your life, you know, and the station's run by software. So um, occasionally the space station goes out of control. Yeah. But so what? Like it, it's not like everybody dies just because you stop pointing exactly the way that you wanted to point. In fact, every time a ship docks with us, we shut off our attitude control system and let the station tumble for a while until, because when you first dock, you're not tightly joined and you have to let everything sort of damp out. And then you have to drive the mechanisms that dock you in tight. And then once you've got everything secure, then you can fire up the systems that get you back under attitude control again. And while I was commanding the space station, um, I, no, I guess I hadn't quite taken over command, but while I was living on the space station on my third flight, uh, we did a, a, a operating system upgrade on the station and they'd been working on it on the ground for years and and they'd been they'd given it to us in training and then they warned us a week in advance and two days in advance one day in advance two hours in advance everything was going to be fine we did the countdown three two one to the moment that this new operating system was going to kick in and all the lights went out all the fans shut off we lost communication with earth and the vehicle went out of control <laughs> Wow. That happened while I was on station. It's on like, behalf of all great. software engineers, I apologize. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, Earth. What do we do now? So we actually dug into, we trained for it. We dug into this old, um, very primitive software program called Mighty Mouse. And by getting Mighty Mouse into the computers, we could then manually start controlling things. Just, you know, really roughshod, but, but just getting control of systems you know, I was down in the Russian segment using their VHF radio, talking to people in Brazil so that they could relay messages to people in Houston, you know, using ham radio and anything we could just to try and get stuff sorted out again. And we eventually got um, attitude control and then you can start pointing antennas and then you can talk to Houston and then and then they can start taking over and, and you're reconfiguring everything. And on my second space flight, while we were docked with the shuttle, um, the main computers that run the whole space station started overwriting their own hard drives and eating them. And, and the whole space station lost control while I was there. We had to get the shuttle to take complete control of the attitude of the space station and, and use its thrusters to hold the station in the right attitude for a couple of days while we, we and then we had to, Jim Voss and I had to do the brain surgery and take these general purpose computers out and take their hard drives out and put new hard drives in and, you know, that sort of stuff happens pretty regularly. And when you bring up a whole new module like um, Nauka, which is, you know, uh, Russian for, you know, science or scientist, um, and uh, 
when Nauka docked, there was some sort of software problem and it didn't know it was fully docked and it fired its thrusters when it wasn't supposed to. So everybody reacted the right way and you know stopped the thrusters firing and didn't have thrusters combating it. And of course the station got some momentum and, and eventually they sorted out and got it back under control. That's, you don't want that to happen, but hey, you have to build a tough enough spaceship that it can soak up that kind of thing. You know, think about the Millennium Falcon, you know, with Han Solo flying that thing. That's one tough ship and it's a good thing too, you know, because, and that you need to build tough spaceships. They can't be just Swiss watches, you know, they, uh, they, they need to be a really ruggedized, keeps on ticking kind of machines. Otherwise, you know, everyone's going to die. <laughs> that is, that is a frank and very, very fair point. Yeah, so that that's that's really exciting, and I did not know that software had created so many problems in space. And and uh, I'm I'm on the flip side of this, often uh, surprised that software is is often quite outdated by the time it makes its way into space. But given the problems that you mentioned, I can totally understand why. I can I do not blame you in any way if 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 like. Uh, you prefer to have uh, existing software that you've gone up with and you know works as opposed to wanting to take a bet on a new operating system that creates all these problems. That, that is something for us to fix on earth and, and hopefully, uh, hopefully we, we uh, reduce these issues. Yeah, Na NASA doesn't get rewarded for getting it wrong. You know? And so if they have a system that works, then why, what would be their motivation to change it? You know, if they know this works and it took a lot of money to prove that this works, you can understand yeah. why they do that, you know, and and if you look at SpaceX and maybe we'll be talking about them when they're flying people in space, they're kind of stuck with that same paradigm. They they can't afford to risk a whole bunch of people's lives just because someone has a, maybe what might be a better idea. You have to go with systems that we know are going to work. But if there's nobody on board and all you're risking is, you know, money then you have a lot more latitude to make a mistake. And I think in software, the whole beta testing idea, um, it, it, it's kind of revolutionary uh, for something as, as traditional as space flight. We, we use it for a lot of other things, but, but in space flight, we've had a very archaic, staid, conservative way of developing. And, uh, and we, we kind of need both to fast track and move forwards. And so it's really interesting to watch you know, what Boeing's doing right now with their spaceship, um, what uh, NASA is contracting with, with their spaceship, and what, uh, what SpaceX is doing with their spaceships, just kind of different models and different levels of uh, risk acceptance and, and software acceptance. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a fascinating time for development. Yeah, so software generally likes to push out a little early, uh, and that's completely unacceptable when when human lives are at stake and and this model of perhaps uh, autonomous systems get the new software uh many versions of it until it's proven you know beyond the beyond the doubt before human lives are at risk that makes a lot of sense to me but i guess in this case for the uh space station uh we don't have another space station um that that is actually in orbit there, there must be variants of it uh in on the ground and in different places that test the space station on the ground but but yeah, this is uh, really embarrassing, and I and I hope that software catches up to a point where we don't have these problems in space. Um, so the first pieces of the space station started being built in the early '90s. Think what level of computer technology we had then. What what did the 1553 bus interfaces look like back then? What was the typical amount of memory capacity? What did a laptop look like in 1990? you know, compared to now. And, but we had to kind of fix design then. And we launched the first piece in 98. So imagine launching something now, you know, uh, 30 years or 20 years later, 20, whatever, three years later, that has to integrate perfectly with something that was launched in 98. How do you even check that everything's going to work? You know, and you're right, there are uh, iron birds on the ground uh, as sort of, you know, test modules, but even they've been around for 25 years now. So are, and are we still maintaining them properly? Yeah, it, it is, it's, it's not easy by any means. Yeah, it's, it, it's rough and, uh, and, and I hope uh, we can help uh, NASA if, if we can. I'll, I have some contacts there and, and if, if possible, I'll try and uh, see if, if anything from my Stanford side can, can be of, of use. We'll see. So moving on to things going wrong in space, but then back to reality, you are on the board of Open Lunar Foundation. So um, uh, 
this is a this is a foundation that well actually you should tell us about it so so you're, you're spending uh how much of your time on open lunar what is the mission and uh and and all i know is, well i know a little bit about it but but in the context of of you know, a, 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 an, espionage, an espionage operation that could potentially in the future happen in space, say uh, someone trying to in a hostile manner take over a, a satellite or something like that. Um, would the Open Lunar Foundation try and um, have rules or regulations for that? First, perhaps start with an introduction and then and then whatever sure. you do. So, so here's the fundamental question, Reza, and that is um, whose laws do you follow on the moon? You know, who's what are the property rights? Um, what are what's trespassing look like on the moon and and who whose rules? You know, and we, we don't know right now. And we back in the 60s, uh, when Apollo was just starting to uh, get close to landing on the moon, um, the United Nations addressed this same issue. And they said what they really feared at the time was nuclear proliferation in space. They didn't want nuclear weapons in space. And that was pretty unanimous around the world that nobody really wanted, you know, yes, countries need advantage and geopolitical might and all the rest of it and defend their interests, but nobody wanted nuclear weapons in space. Um, and so they put together a committee for the peaceful uh, use of outer space, uh, COPOIS, one of the most tortured uh, acronyms ever. And, um, but they also wrote the Outer Space Treaty and it sort of gave us the basic early framework of law off the planet Earth. And, and it's not bad, but it's not nearly specific enough. You know, and it's kind of aspirational. And it was written in the late 60s before we even walked to the moon, let alone space stations and, and you know, Chinese space stations and everything else. So it desperately needs updating. So what should we do about uh, you know, the fact that the Chinese have uh, put relay satellites around the moon and, and have landed a rover on the moon and are working hard towards putting people on the moon? That in fact, every space agency in the world right now has the expressed purpose of putting people onto the moon. You know, first orbiting the moon and then settling on the surface of the moon. Because we discovered huge reserves of water, 100 billion gallons of water frozen into the craters of the moon. And at the poles, we have eternal solar power. And if you got power and you got water, then if you build a good habitat, you can live there. So, so that's really interesting. And, and it drops the cost way down. And Elon's building Starship, which is another order of magnitude cheaper than any other rocket ship we've ever built. And NASA has recently given him $3 billion to make that the lunar lander. And of course, the other companies that were in the competition don't think that was fair, even though they can't compete uh, on the financial side. So you can understand NASA's motivations, but you know everyone's got to sort that out legally. But what it means is it's happening fast. It's happening fast. And the first vehicle to land on moon on the moon with the intention of settlement could be a private commercial vehicle. There, there is essentially nothing to stop Elon Musk once he gets his vehicle to, and he might fly it orbital here uh, just within the next month or two. Um, what is the impediment to him actually going to the moon on his own? And you know, he does have to follow the rules of the country that gave him the launch license. But, you know, he's building um, offshore oil rigs. And, you know, that's kind of interesting to launch his starship from. So that, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a confusing legal set of circumstances. Or if the Soviets decide, or, or the Chinese, of course, they've got their own agenda and their own set of laws. But, um, and so, uh, what are we going to do? And wouldn't it be stupid if we didn't pay any attention to it and all we did was import a little America and a little China and a little Russia or whatever. And they existed as three uh, cold warring factions. We just imported our current bad snapshot of geopolitics and just you know, stuck that on the moon like a reflection of the year 2021. You know, it'd be like if we went to the moon and said, well, let's bring COVID too, because that's one of the things we're doing right now. You know, <laughs> we can do better than that. So the Open Lunar Foundation, it's not the only one in the world, but it's, it's a real world leading one. It's based there in San Francisco, and I'm chair of the board of that, is looking to try and help all of those different organizations talk to each other about it and, and look at what are 
reasonable solutions. You can't just be high and mighty. You can't say everybody has to behave perfectly and sacrosanct and you can't touch anything or do anything. But you can also say, you know, uh, winner take all, first person there gets to keep everything and, uh, and, you know, we'll just our absolute most base greedy human behavior. Neither of those are desired outcome. There's middle ground that can meet as many of everybody's purposes as possible um, that maybe we can do better than just the inertia of geopolitical history. And we have some pretty good examples of it on Earth, Antarctica being one of them. I mean, Antarctica is a whole continent, sort of like the moon, that our technology wasn't good enough to get to. I mean, nobody had been to South, South Pole until 2010 or 20, or I'm sorry, 1910 or 1911, 110 years ago. Nobody had been there. So it's still really recent. And yet it was still very hard to get to. And so we kind of took our time and we have a whole different set of rules in Antarctica to any other continent on earth. So we can do it. And there are little subsets, you know, communities and, and come look at, I don't know, look at the Amish population within the United States, you know, they, or any particular sect uh, or, or subgroup that has self-identified that, that has legal representation to live under a different set of laws from the other citizens. We have ways to do it. And that exists in lots of different countries. So Open Lunar is really heavily involved in looking at all of those models and then working with uh, you know, the current U.S. administration, the other space agencies, the, the, all the space folks in Luxembourg, um, the, the United Nations folks, and working directly with uh, China, working directly with Russia. You know, you got to be really careful. You know, you, 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 can't, uh, you can't burn all your bridges by aligning yourself uh, to, to something that no one else finds palatable. You've got you to be smart and careful, but it's work that needs doing. Because how we settle the moon, that's how we're going to settle every other planet we ever get to. We're setting the precedent now. And we have a really great example of the International Space Station, which was conceived in the 80s, we were 70s, but started thinking really serious in the 80s, and then built in the 90s, launched in 98. And we have had continuous human presence, international, 15 plus nations, continuous 24 seven, 365 days a year for almost 21 years. And it doesn't follow any earth law. It's got its own legal system called the International Crew Code of Conduct. And yeah, it's a special set of circumstances, but it works. And countries that are busy, you know, having all their own agendas and Russia and the United States, and, you know, they still cooperate 24 seven in maintaining and operating the International Space Station, Japan and Germany and England and Canada and you know countries with the bad history with each other, and yet it's working. And so there's a huge, not just a technical experiment, but a geopolitical experiment going on in the International Space Station. And what Open Lunar Foundation is trying to do is learn from all that and let people think about it now before we just sort of blunder into it because the technology allowed us to. Actually, let's actually try and get some nascent rules out there, some agreements, so that um, so that we we try and do as well as we possibly can. And and uh, to me, it's the right thing to be doing, especially as someone who's orbited the world two thousand six hundred times and, and you know piloted and commanded a spaceship. Um, yeah, I, I see the importance of it, and that's why I've, I've been uh, you know I, I'm heavily involved with Open Lunar Foundation. I'm really proud of the work that they're doing. I really, really appreciate you're doing that. And, and exactly as you said, I really hope we don't export our cold wars into space. It would be about as bad or worse than exporting COVID into space. So let's, let's not do that. And thank you, for, uh, thank you for taking leadership on, on trying to stop that. And hopefully you're, you're successful. Um, so uh, Chris, what do you say we transition to questions? So, so we've gathered questions from both uh, folks who are uh, working at Metroid, Metroiders, and and other folks uh so maybe we could spend a few minutes on that and then and then wrap up if that's okay with you yep so, sounds great to me i do want to mention though uh, i'm an advisor to spacex uh i'm an advisor to uh, a company called astrolab i'm actually you know, sort of an, a board advisor to them i'm on the advisory board of virgin galactic um and and i work in advisory capacity with several other space companies also because I really don't want to squander all the experience that I've had. I want to try and help 
apply it and let other people, if at all possible, benefit from it. But um, so, you know, those are companies, but I'm also working with uh, nonprofits and, and, uh, and some other ventures as well. I'm also with Momentus, which is just, it's looking at space tugs and, you know, how to transport things in and around Earth orbit. And I'm on the board now that they've gone public, I'm on the board of Momentus as well. So, so lots of space activity in addition to the work I'm doing at the nonprofit at Open Lunar. Got it. That's actually a great segue into uh, a question that someone asked. This is a question from John Goddard, who is a descendant of Robert Goddard, the creator wow. of uh, the liquid fueled rocket. So he works here. John works here. His great uncle, I believe, is, is Rob Goddard. His question relates to exactly what you just said, which is, so what does the privatization of the space industry mean for astronauts and astronaut selection and training? So I have an additional question uh, do you reckon Elon is just going to be the first guy to uh, walk on Mars if he can make it happen? So if, if he can if he can end up making it safe enough, do you reckon he's going to do it himself? And then also, what does it mean for private companies uh, selecting astronauts and training them? Sure. Well, I think everybody in the back of their mind realizes spaceflight has always been uh, privatized. You know, uh, Rockwell built the space shuttle. Boeing managed the space station. Uh, Grumman built the lunar lander. You know, private companies for profit built all the space hardware. NASA doesn't do much hardware building. They contract it out. Um, but the big change recently has been our, our technology is so good now that the cost has come low enough that now uh, it's not just governments who are customers, but, but private entities can be customers and not just of, of robotic spaceflight, but of human spaceflight. That's, that's the big transition, is that now a private company can be safe enough and therefore cheap enough that, um, that they can fly people in space. So, but that's no different than I think uh, airplanes uh, in the 1910s. Like if you had asked Orville and Wilbur Wright, who first flew in December of what, 1903, I think, or the first Canadian flight um, at Bedeck in 1909. If you'd asked a guy named J.A. McCurdy, it was Alexander Graham Bell who funded it. Pretty cool. This guy who had made his fortune in telecommunications was really interested in aerospace. And he brought in all these brilliant people and built this thing that they called the Silver Dart, was named after the material. And that was the first you know, private, space or private airplane flight in Canada. Really sort of similar set of circumstances. But if you talk to those guys and said, you know, by 1950 and said, well, you know, now we've got whatever the Boeing 707 wasn't quite there in 1950, but close. The Boeing 707 is just taking unqualified people right across the Atlantic. Doesn't that somehow cheapen your experience as being a space pioneer? And they would laugh at you. They go, no, that's why I was doing it. You know, we were, we were inventing this uh, and taking all the risks so that uh, it could somehow then become part of regular human commerce and human uh, technology, you know, and, and sort of like cars were crazy dangerous at the start. And, and, and think about crash protection in, in a Model T in 1912, you know, um, and how bad roads were and how bad, you know, what was a gas station in 1912 and all the rest of that. So, uh, so no, I think it's great. And it's not like there isn't still work for professional pilots. You know, someone needs to operate these complex machines in the unforeseeable circumstances. For the boring stuff, you engage your autopilot and that, that's fine. But stuff breaks and you hit birds and things ice up and you don't always know what's going to happen. And, and you need, you know, ingenuity and, and cleverness on board. And that's what people are good for. And so uh, that's it. There's a whole universe to explore. And, and it, when you're just orbiting the world, or if you're just going to the moon and back over, the, you know, maybe 20 years from now, we'll understand that well enough, maybe to make it largely automated and therefore cheaper and therefore safer, um, or no, wrong order, a lot simpler and therefore safer and therefore you can do it more cheaply so that that becomes a more normal human experience. But Mars is still going to be wicked hard for a long time and everything beyond Mars and the rest of the universe. And, and someone's still going to have to operate all these things, you know, and some of it you'll be able to let robots do, but some of it you won't. And so, uh, so no, I'm all for it. And, and I helped, you know, I was one of the, you know, hundreds and hundreds of astronauts and the tens of thousands of people in the aerospace industry who have worked for a long time to try and make all this better so that it becomes, uh, 
a much bigger part of normal life for humanity. So no, I, I think it's great. We, we need to regulate it. You know, the FAA, um, you know, and, and other FCC and other boards, bodies, they need to, you, you can't just have it all happen willy nilly. You know, you've got to set up rules that protect people and, and you don't want to completely fill the sky with junk. You got to, you know, you got to try and do the best job as you go. But, um, but no, I, I think uh, free enterprise is, is a terrific enabler. And, uh, and the United States is absolutely leading the world right now. If you look at Blue Origin and SpaceX and Virgin Galactic, uh, you know, what those guys are doing, you know, nobody else is even close. So I, I, I'm, uh, I, I think it's all a pretty cool and exciting development of all the other work that's gone on. Excellent. Uh, building off of that, uh, in particular, what you said about robots, uh, Jeff Seller asks, how would AI change the experience or day-to-day -day lives of astronauts in space? Perhaps uh, building off of that is, and is there something that you wish you would have taken with you on Expedition 35, meaning that something that uh, doesn't exist that would have been awfully helpful to have, or perhaps it didn't exist back then and now, now exists? Uh, have, you ha have you had any basically technology changes that you wish you had with you? Uh, in, on Expedition 35 or technology that isn't here yet that you wish could be there uh, up in the, uh, the space station or, or, or in any of the flights that you've taken into space? Sure. And, and I, I just forgot to mention on the last one, John Goddard being a relative of Robert Goddard. I mean, Robert Goddard is legend. He's one of the giants of, of making space flight possible. He's like, you know, Tsiolkovsky, who was the, the Soviet designer of so many things, but Robert Goddard was, was the American version of that. And just, he laid the groundwork for everything. So that's very cool that, that John uh, asked me that question. So I, I honor your family for the work that you've done. So for Jeff's question about artificial intelligence, sure. I mean, I could not have flown in space without uh, uh, the early versions of artificial intelligence. Like how, how does a, you know, a, a uh, attitude control platform work, you know, so that it can, I can navigate in space. And, you know, um, I, we had the capability on the shuttle to actually do star shots where you would turn the shuttle and you would use a star thing, a, a little super sensitive light, and you would find a particular pattern of stars. And then we would rotate the shuttle through 90 degrees and find another pattern of stars. And we had to be the judge of when to push the trigger so that we would get those stars captured. And then by measuring the exact angle through the accelerometers and gyroscopes of the shuttle as to how far it had turned, then we could build a, a, an attitude position of where we were. And then, and then compare that to you know, the magnetic field of the earth and things happening underneath and build our state vector. I mean, it was very manual and very primitive and therefore pretty inaccurate and obviously Computers are going to be better at that than the Apollo crews were, or I was, um, and, and so that automation, uh, and then using essentially miniaturized uh, external uh, logic, is absolutely critical for improving what's going on on the space station and beyond. Probably the biggest thing, though, is space is hostile to the human body. Most of it, you can't go outside, you know, wearing this blue T-shirt. Um, so we, uh, the guy who used to run, um, the big, uh, Ames NASA facility close to where, where you're sitting today. Um, uh, he, he had a great quote, uh, a few years ago, um, uh, his name's Pete Warden. And, uh, he said, uh, well, if we do things properly, when the first or the next human being lands on the moon, uh, a robot will hand him a martini. <laughs> and, and that's the truth because, uh, it's nasty on the surface of the moon. I mean, where the ground is hundreds of degrees burning up and reflecting at you, where, you know, the sun is, is wicked, wicked hot. And then when the moon slowly turns, so because your days are like two weeks long and then your nights are two weeks long, you know, where it gets down minus hundreds and hundreds of degrees at night, you know, that's just way too much so that every time we have to go outside and fix something, we have to build a spacesuit that will protect this, this fragile, you know, flesh and blood way better to have intelligent systems. It's why I work with Astrolab because they're building this great set of rovers to, to do the work out there. Um, but we need, uh, and I'm working with a company called Sanctuary that's looking at this just right now on what sort of uh, humanoid 
interface uh, makes sense for that type of environment so that a human can go out and operate it or a robot can operate it with, with partially remote control <coughs> and partially artificial intelligence. And I know that SpaceX just this last little while announced that they're working on a similar sort of uh, technology and we need that. And sending stuff to the moon, it's only got like two or three seconds lag depending on how you're communicating. You go to Mars, you can't talk to anything ever again. All you can do is send it a packet and then wait a long time and then it'll tell you later how it did. So it needs its own intelligence or, or, or a very simple task. So, so yeah, for exploration anywhere beyond the earth moon system, we're stopped if we don't have artificial intelligence of some level. And the better the artificial intelligence, the better our results are gonna be. And if you even just look at perseverance and, and uh, ingenuity that are driving and flying around Mars right now, they are worlds better than you know Sojourner and the early uh, rovers that we put on there because our technology and our artificial intelligence has gotten better. So yeah, that, that's the way we got to go. And it's just going to be a huge enabler um, so that we can only go for what people are good at. And that is art and discovery and awareness and meaning and, and then handling the really strange complex uh, pop-up stuff. You know, that's, we don't need to be there just to move rocks around. You know, that's not, that's, that's not what we're especially good at. And, and so, uh, so yeah, I'm all for it. And that's the direction we're all heading to. And that's uh, hopefully a good test bed for the operating system so that next time we send you an operating system, it is uh, not gonna bug out on you. So actually Perseverance had a little, uh, little uh, helicopter on it that, uh, that had a very modern operating system, Linux, in comparison to the other operating systems that have made their way into space. Uh, and that's been that's been really fun to see. So hopefully yeah. we send more of those autonomous uh, objects up there and 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 prove things out. Um, so an, uh, so so another question from uh, Darren Shea. Uh, he asks, what are new technologies is in, technologies in space that could be applied to our daily life in the near future? Did you see something out there that you want? In your life these days, that you're you're uh, you're wishing would make its way into perhaps commercial availability. Sure. Well, we use them all the time, Darren. Obviously, you just probably you know like GPS. Obviously, think how you know, revolutionary GPS has been for so many different things, and and that's a space based technology. Uh, just think of telecommunications. Uh, it's really intriguing to think that Starlink, you know, the the SpaceX uh, internet that's up there. Um, because they are now using lasers to communicate between all of the little satellites, the speed of light in a vacuum is way faster than the speed of light through a fiber optic cable. So in fact, the internet uh, across the Pacific is faster via Starlink than it is, you know, for on Earth. So that's, you know, that type of use of space in order to give us a better capability on the surface. We're applying that in a lot of different ways. Um, and then using the high ground of space to understand the world better. You know, from the Bay Area, it is really hard to tell what's going on in, in Indonesia or Greenland or the ocean levels or, or the Pacific, uh, the South Pacific current or whatever. Um, whereas from space, you can see and measure those things constantly all the time. So it provides a terrific platform uh, that is, basically impossible to mirror from, from the surface of the earth in any sort of economic way. Um, but if you look at the stuff we haven't tapped into yet, uh, one, one of the simpler ones is, is uh, and that is so desperately needed, is power generation. Uh, the Industrial Revolution was a, a huge turning point in the history of our species. You know, where, where uh, quality of life, standard of living and education, uh, we're all and, and we're all improving and, and steadily, you know, uh, for for everybody involved for the first time in human history. And, and it led to huge advances in uh, medicine and, and uh, quality of human life. You know, in, in 1800, 80 percent of everybody was below abject poverty and now 10 percent is. And that's a product of the Industrial Revolution but we built it on the back of fossil fuels. And you know, one success causes another problem. And if you're gonna have nine or 10 billion people, which we're headed towards as the, probably our peak population, 
um, we can't just be burning dinosaurs. It, you know, we pollute our air and pollute our oceans in an irreversible way. And what do you do with all the waste? And how do you generate enough few food? We need a different energy source. And so we're obviously some pretty good work going on in fusion here on the surface. And obviously solar is, is impressive and um, wind and, and other ones. But uh, the sun always shines in space. And there's nothing between you and the sun. So if you can collect solar power in space and then change it to a different frequency so that you can beam it down to the surface of the earth, um, that's so long as you can build a structure up there. And that's been our limiter. We haven't, we haven't had the rocket ships and the capability to be able to uh, feasibly build uh, a solar power collection facility in orbit. But, but there's nothing to stop us doing it except just uh, in making sure the technology is good enough. So that's a really interesting opportunity. And it's not feasible yet, but once Starship is going, it's going to be way more feasible. Cheap, heavy lift uh, is going to change uh, things. Um, and then, uh, you know, some of the uh, technologies that we are developing up there, uh, like 100% closed uh, water system, so that you can recycle essentially 100% of your water on board. That we're close to that on station. We recycle about 90 or 92 percent of the water on station. And when you really push in that technology, just uh, as part of of the station, then that that helps drive it happening back on the surface of the Earth. And you could say, well, why do we have to go to space to do that? Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos didn't grow up to invent PayPal and be package delivery people. They are huge. Uh, fans and were hugely motivated and inspired and driven by space exploration. That's what gets them up every morning. That's where their heart is. That's why they became successful businessmen was because of that drive of wanting to be part of this amazing thing that's happening. And, you know, you could say, well, we, you know, we don't need space to have good cars, but the people that are designing the cool stuff for your cars, they are hugely inspired by the cutting edge stuff that's going on in exploring the universe. You got to give the young designers and inventors and makers, you've got to give them a different vision than just, you know, uh, repeating what's been going on. And, and so part of it is direct application of what's happening, but part of it is sort of the whole human cycle of how it is that we challenge ourselves and then put ourselves in a position to invent new things. And, and that goes on you know, on the space station and in all the businesses around space exploration all the time too. Yeah, it seems like in general, power generation and sustainability are things that are, are space exploration really pushes the envelope on those things. And then the technologies make their way back to help our daily lives. Um, that, that, yeah, certainly the case. Uh, Chris, we are uh, running up to time. One last question from uh, Chase Hart, which who is our graphic designer and, and video editor. He will actually be helping to edit this video so that we can make it even nicer for the audience at home. His question is a, is a, a little uh, nebulous, perhaps. Is there something in space that you saw that you couldn't explain? And uh, and we can we can have that as be the last question and uh, and and. Uh, it might be a little controversial of a question. So feel free to say, well, you know, we could explain most things and anything we can't explain, we didn't look at hard enough. Well, I, I can take that question lots of different ways. I can hardly explain anything in space. I mean, <laughs> uh, you know, why is the sky dark if there's an unlimited number of suns? And yeah, you can put out some ideas, but you're guessing, um, you know, why is the universe 14 and a half billion years old? You know, what was there before that? Um, what, how, how do black holes actually behave and exist? Um, you know, there's so much, what is dark matter and dark energy? There's this great experiment on the top of the space station called the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer that's trying to answer that exact question. Because we don't know, as, a, as the leading scientists and, and physicists in the world, we don't know what 94% of the universe is even made of. We can only account for 6% of the observable universe based on our model of how everything works. So when you ask me, did I see anything I didn't understand? It's like, <laughs> it's like you know, a baby was just born and the doctor has picked them up by their feet and slapped them, put them down on the table. So say, did you see anything you didn't understand? You're just an infant. 
suddenly out in a hugely inexplicable and overwhelmingly different universe. So no, we, we hardly under, we, we do our best, but you know, it's still a lot of it. We're just on the, on the niggling edge of starting to, to understand it. Um, we don't even really know how many stars there are in our galaxy. The numbers, you know, they vary by like a billion, you know, is it 200 billion or 300 billion stars? I mean, those are big numbers. Um, so, so yeah, I think I became even more acutely aware of the minusculity, if that's a word, of my understanding of anything. But on the flip side of that same question, uh, are there a UFOs? Are there aliens? Which is another way to say, did you see anything you didn't understand? Uh, I, I just categorically say no astronaut has ever seen an alien. It's never happened. It's what we're looking. That's why Perseverance is driving around on Mars. It's why uh, you know, Ingenuity is flying around on Mars, why we're drilling into that river delta or lake delta on Mars. We're trying to find out if we're alone in the universe or not. We're staring at other planets around other stars. We're listening to radio signals. We're, you know, the breakthrough prize. They're, they're looking at trying to answer that exact question in our own solar system or beyond. Um, and to think, you know, it, it's just, I mean, it's fun to think of UFOs. And it's kind of like, you know, it's like comic books and stuff. It's great, it's fun, it's like the X-Men. It's kind of a fun thing, you know, it's cosplay, it's great. And why would I burst anybody's bubble if they find that entertaining and fun, you know? But, but the reality is we have never seen a UFO. No matter if someone stares at hundreds of hours of space station video and a little particle of ice flows by and they go, see, see, that was a UFO and they, they're not telling us about that UFO. I mean, it just, it, it's cute, you know, but it's unfortunately, I mean, if we had seen a UFO, I mean, <laughs> think how much bigger NASA's budget would be if we could, you know, if that's, if that's what's actually going on, you know, and, and why is our technology so ridiculously primitive? You know, none of it even passes a fundamental sniff test of logic, but what's the harm? In, and, and that's, I think, recently when, you know, those Navy HUD tapes, suddenly everybody's an expert on HUD tapes. You know, I was a Navy test pilot and I helped develop HUD technology or HUD symbology and things. And so it's, it's just funny listening to the news of, oh, yeah, look at this in the heads up display. And that's, you know, people call that a HUD. Anyway, um, <laughs> you know, and, and here's a thing in a HUD that this must, we don't know what this is. So it's got to be alien technology. I'm like, that's a bit of a leap, guys, and and um, and there's an awful lot of airplanes flying around the world all the time, uh, and uh, and you know I spent a lot of my life at altitude. So uh, anyway, I, I'm happy to have people wonder about UFOs or, or whatever acronym you want to use, and and to dream about the fact that there's life somewhere besides Earth. And I sure hope there is, because if we're it, if we're the only intelligent life that has ever existed then we got to do a way better job of, of planning for the future. It, it, you know, and we've never found any evidence of any life, not even you know, blue-green algae anywhere except Earth, let alone intelligent life. So, so to me, it's a really important question. And that's why we're exploring space. That's one of the biggest reasons is to try and answer just that question. Are we alone or not? And the odds would seem that with, you know, an unlimited number of stars, it's like, I can't know, 28 zeros, a, a septillion or something of planets out there, um, which is such a big number, it's essentially infinite. The odds would seem overwhelming that if life developed here, it has to have developed in other places. But intelligent life, as far as we can tell, that only developed to our level once in 4 billion years here on Earth. One time, there's no evidence to, con to contrary of that. So I think we should try to build a little perspective about that, that, um, that we have something really precious, not just the raw natural material of our home planet, but the, the ability to question it and think about it that exists between our ears and not squander that. And it's one of the reasons that's driving Elon to go interplanetary because there's lots of geologic evidence of bad things happening to the earth that would at least wipe out civilization, if not wipe out our entire species. And let's get all our eggs out of one basket when we're at this sudden weird tipping point between the ice ages that allows us to go do this thing. So um, 
So to me, it, it's, I don't get all, <coughs> excuse me, I don't get all hung up about it. And, and I think UFO uh, spotting is fun. You know, it's like crop circles and, and whatever else people want to think about. Um, but, uh, but the fundamental reasons behind it, I think are really important. And, uh, and it's why I've been involved in space exploration my whole life. And it's, it's why I'm writing books about it because, because I want people to really get a sense for what it's like and, and, to, and to see how this fit in in the past and, and all the cool stuff we're doing right now. So, uh, so thanks for having me on to chat with you today, Liz. Thank you, Chris. Really appreciate your time. And uh, you can order Chris's book right now, The Apollo Murders. It's, it's out in October and pre-order is immediately available. Thank you, Chris, again for your time and uh, hope to fly with you again soon. Cheers. Yeah, I look forward to the next time we can go drive, drive a tail dragger around south of San Francisco. Thanks. Fly well, and I look forward to, to seeing you next time we get a chance.